the power of users. Why healthcare innovation is increasingly going to rely on the insights of patients. These days there are very few certainties, but this is one of them. We're all going to depend increasingly on healthcare innovation for the quality of our future lives. Keeping ourselves healthy, coping with chronic ailments, living into old age with dignity and independence. We all want this, and we're going to need all the help we can find to help us get there. Which explains the huge and growing size of the healthcare industry and the explosion of startups in this space. Healthcare innovation matters. But look again at that first paragraph. This isn't a sector we can be entirely objective about, looking in through the window at it. It's about us. It concerns each of us as individuals, with all the diversity that that implies. We all have a stake in healthcare innovation, but we're also aware that one size isn't necessarily going to fit us all. So there's real scope for our voices to be heard and our ideas to be used. A classic opportunity for user innovation. Now, the rhetoric's been there for a long time. For example, back in 2002, the United Kingdom's National Health Service underwent a major review which concluded that putting patients in control and helping them to be fully engaged in their health care is likely to be more cost-effective and offer better value for money than if people are simply passive recipients of services. But this isn't just a nice-to-have aspiration. There's good evidence that bringing users into the innovation equation is of value. We've known for some time that users have important knowledge and insights which can help shape the creation and adoption of innovation. Of course they do. They have a stake in the outcome. They have an incentive to innovate and they're willing to experiment and test prototypes which can help move towards solving their problems and meeting their needs. User innovation's always been with us. It's just only now are we beginning to realise its scope. For example, a recent UK study suggested that over 10% of product innovations and nearly 20% of process innovations owe their start in life to user ideas. Some researchers, notably Eric von Hippel at MIT, who has pioneered studies in this field, some researchers see a new model of the innovation process emerging. Typically, innovation is seen as some kind of a funnel in which many ideas are kicked around, promising contenders developed, and eventually one finished version emerges to be adopted by others. But in the alternative user-led model, we have more of an hourglass shape, with many ideas at the front end, some focused development of the core principle, and then another explosion of variety as the idea is launched and users adapt and modify it. We've seen the power of user innovation in sectors as diverse as agriculture and automobiles. And we know that a lot of this kind of innovation has been happening for some time in the healthcare field. Some examples highlight the potential this approach has. For example, Lisa Kreitis, an American broadcast journalist, was 42 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Following a mastectomy, she was advised not to shower because of the risk of bacterial infection to her surgical drains from the tap water. Her frustration at not being able to shower led her to experiment with various homemade solutions, originally based on plastic rubbish bags. After five different prototypes, she finally came up with the design for the shower shirt, a water-resistant garment which allows patients suffering from a variety of conditions to take a shower safely. It's now FDA approved and it's improved the quality of life for thousands of people around the world. Or Paul Bach, who was an industrial design student who became tetraplegic after an accident. Confined to a wheelchair, he realised that the market didn't offer mobility solutions which matched his lifestyle. His frustration led him to develop a range of add-on hand bikes which gave him back some measure of independence. As he explained, I set out to make my own inventions. I wanted something that would solve my basic problem, 
autonomy and dependence. Once again, the solution he found for his problem has ended up benefiting many others. Sometimes such user innovation takes an extreme trajectory. In the case of Tal Goldsworthy, his diagnosis with Marfan syndrome, which is a heart problem which led to his having an aortic aneurysm, held out little hope beyond high-risk open-heart surgery. Instead, he designed ExoVasc, an external support for the aortic roof, and then he persuaded a surgeon to implant the device. As a result, he's still alive nearly 20 years later, and so are hundreds of other patients who benefited from his idea. These and hundreds of other stories like them can be found on a platform called Patient Innovation, which has a simple purpose – to discover and diffuse user innovations of this kind in the field of healthcare. Not all users, of course, want to be innovators. There are really two problems with user innovation. First, users aren't equal. Some are classic user innovators, tolerant of failure and with a high incentive for innovation. Those examples we just gave are clear illustrations of this. But not everyone is a hero innovator of this kind. In fact, we can identify a spectrum of user innovation ranging from those who are passive to those who are highly active. And we can identify at least three different positions for user involvement along this spectrum. We have the informed patient, someone who's equipped to use technology based on their improved understanding. For example, accessing and managing their own health records and making informed decisions about courses of action, becoming partners with healthcare professionals. Or the involved patient, playing an active role within a wider healthcare delivery system and enabled to do so by technology. Here the approaches widely used in the commercial sector are finding increasing application with users actively engaged at the front end of innovation, evaluating prototypes, providing valuable feedback to help pivot designs and acting as a crowdsourced laboratory for development. And we have the innovating patient, providing ideas of their own based on their deep understanding of their healthcare issue. At the limit, we find here the kind of patient innovators we've just described, prototyping and trialling their ideas out on themselves or on their nearest and dearest. But there's a second question, which is around how we engage users as innovators. We've seen that users differ in how far they're willing or feel able to participate in innovation, but how do we involve them? Are there ways to help them articulate their ideas and concerns? Maybe even ways to move them along the spectrum to enable their voices to be heard? How can we release the power of users? Well, that's a very big question, but it's one which we're looking at in a major international project headquartered in Norway. The focus is on the tools and methods which might help user engagement in healthcare such as design methods, using tools to articulate and hear the patient voice, things like storytelling and journey mapping, right through to online collaboration platforms. And one of the big areas we're exploring is the idea of opening up boundary spaces. Innovation is interaction around ideas. That's why prototyping is so important. Boundary objects, prototypes, enable different stakeholders to have their say. But what about environments which help? It's the same principle, interaction for innovation, and essentially leads to a kind of space for co-creation. Boundary spaces aren't simply rooms to meet, but environments which are designed to be supportive in an enabling, catalytic and challenging way. Interest in this idea of boundary spaces explains the explosive growth of innovation labs. Now these days, every self-respecting company, and indeed not-for-profit and public sector organisations, will have their own version of an innovation lab. Whether you call them labs or hubs or maker spaces or fab labs or accelerators or hotspots, you can hardly turn a street corner or a magazine page before you bump into another example. The names may vary, but the underlying idea is the same. 
a place where people can meet to get inspired and supported by each other to articulate and co-create. And one role they might play is to provide a context within which user innovation might be enabled. Now, expectations run high for innovation labs, but the very ease with which they can be established means that it's also simple to close them down again. Innovation labs and spaces need to be much more than a chill-out room with some beanbags on the floor and whiteboards on the walls. So how might we use the idea of innovation labs as boundary spaces to engage with users? Well, one role model is that offered by Living Labs, an idea which was born around the beginning of the century and which has gathered momentum as a way of enabling social innovation. Defined as a user-centred, iterative, open innovation ecosystem, Living Labs provide a coherent structure for inclusive innovation. The core principles behind such labs could be summarised as follows. They involve co-creation, bringing together a diversity of views, constraints and knowledge sharing to enable exploration of novel approaches. They involve exploration, engaging all stakeholders, especially user communities, at the early stages of the co-creation process. They involve experimentation, prototyping innovations with users while collecting data which can be analysed in its context during evaluation activity. And evaluation, assessing new ideas and innovative concepts as well as related technological artefacts in real-life situations. The model is being used in the Norwegian context within something called the Smart Care Cluster, which is a network of organisations, companies, local authorities, healthcare agencies and so on, who are trying to develop and scale relevant healthcare innovations. It began life in 2019 as a firm-orientated testing centre, but recognition of its wider role and the wider role which users could play, especially at the front end of innovation, has seen continuous adaptation towards playing a role as a boundary space. In its current form, it deploys a range of methods, including the idea of a user café, a café-like co-creation workshop with users, firms and other organisations and relevant parties. Does it work? Well, it's still early in its life, but the feedback from participating firms, local health authorities and, crucially, users suggests that it is providing something new in the innovation landscape. Its long-term success will depend on how well it measures up against an emerging good practice model for successful innovation labs and on how well it deploys one of the core principles in agile innovation, the pivot. Successfully developing innovations involves continual prototyping and testing using the results of that learning experience to refine the next iteration of the innovation. And it's the same with living labs. They need to adapt and grow on a continuing basis, informed by careful reflection and driven by a commitment to action. It's important that they do. Our healthy future might just depend on them. Mm -hmm.